welcome to the Spodcast. My name is Carrie Hyde and I'm your host and your pet's life coach. Today we're going to be talking about longevity and how are we going to get our animals to live longer. That is something that you know I strive for every single day and it's one of the reasons why I started the podcast because our animals, based on the amount of time I've worked with animals, I've watched their health decline, I've watched them um, get sicker earlier, earlier in life. And so today I brought on an expert and I also brought on a guest co-host to help us figure out what we can do in order to get our animals living to their full extent with the health that they deserve. And you know, it's not as hard as you think it is. So I wanna first introduce you to today to my guest co-host, which is Nikki Bass. Nikki, hi. Hi. <laughs> so I brought Nikki on because Nikki has three dogs. Um, she used to have just, uh, I shouldn't even, I know, I don't even want to bring him up, but um, she used to have this little Maltese that was just the love of our life, um, and he passed away, but she now has another one, and she started him on a raw, this dog got started on a raw diet, because Nikki started to learn about different things and what she could do, and so I thought she'd be a great guest co-host for this, because if we could have made Stuart live forever, <laughs> we would have done it. <laughs> we would have done it. Stuart could have, we, we would have done anything to make him live forever, so... Um, so that's what we want to talk about today. And so I also brought on an expert that I'm very excited to introduce you to. Um, so without further ado, Thomas Sandberg, thank you so much for being here. Oh, I'm glad to be here. Thank so you. Tom is a naturopath for pets, and he is started a study to try to um, bring in a whole bunch of animals into this study to figure out about um, how nutrition can have our animals live longer. Tom, can you tell us a little bit about how you got started working with animals? We're gonna go back a little bit before we talk about your study. Can you tell us a little bit about how you got into animals and became a naturopath for animals? Yeah, I'm, I'm originally from Norway and I, I've just been around animals all my life because I come from an animal family and I was Pretty much the day I was born, I had a summer yet next to me, and uh, for for years. So I'm just I, I knew dogs before I knew any humans. So I've been around it forever, and my mom, being the biggest animal lover I know, of, that definitely got into me too. And so I, I've just been around animals all my life. When I came for it to the United States about uh, 20, 25 years ago, I. Um, started to get interested in, um, I had great things in Norway too, and I've always been um, interested in in ways to extend their lives. Because what bothers me most about having a great things is say, everybody seems to love these dogs, but very few wants them because the lives are short. And I got that comment over and over and over again. And in Norway, I was so busy with other things, I couldn't really start anything. But when I came to the United States, I had some opportunity where I could start doing, uh, study more. In, uh, more about these uh, giant breeds and why they live so short and and I came to the conclusion that uh, it has to do with the diet and uh, what we're feeding them and because uh, over here in the United States I saw so much cancer I saw so much other diseases that I didn't see in Norway where we don't feed a lot of kibble not back then most dogs were raw fed I mean even, even think about it we thought that is dog food and then never never ever thought that I'm doing something different than anybody else do until I come here when I see kibble in, a, in the aisles, they go to Costco and things like that, you know, the pellets, the pellets after all kinds of different type of dry food. I said, wait, oh my gosh, this is what they feed over here. And for a split moment, I said, oh my God, this is excellent. It takes me five seconds to feed a dog here. In Norway, it takes me half an hour to feed a couple of things <laughs> and, and because they have to prepare the food. But I realized very quickly that that's not the case. So, when I got my first day in here in uh, in the States, I, I decided that, okay, I'm going to try this, feed them the raw food, like it's sort of what we did in Norway, and then made, but elevate it a little bit and, and get more variation and things like that in. And uh, that's kind of how we started. And I went online. Back then, there wasn't a lot of, wasn't Facebook or anything like that. There were some user groups and things. So I went on one of these and then talked about my Danes. And I happened to mention once in a while that I said a raw food diet. And uh, people just start sort of, wow, you crazy, you're going to kill your dog. And that's also what I heard when I, when I was traveling around for a while too in my RV for five years with two great Danes. And when they, I fed my dogs outside the RV and they 
people who are parents in Pick is like I feeling his dogs and then looking in and it looks like meat. Yeah, that's meat. That's what they're carnivores. Uh, that's what I think. So, but I talked about this um, on, on the internet and slowly people got more interested and I start adding some people into my group that, that I had there and, and we were talking about raw food and stuff and I got this idea to among how many I could gather up and do a little bit of a study, a very loose study was anything fancy or just with your emails and things back and forth. Within 10 years, I gotten 80, 80 dogs into this study. I actually had more, but 80 was the one that kind of consistently followed me. And and uh, during that time, I just started to understand more and more, wow, this is really, really working. Because I, what, what I didn't think about in the beginning was um, cancer. It, it didn't even come to my mind in any, any form other than like into seven, eight years, I said, wait a minute, there's none of these dogs getting cancer. And then we went longer and longer. And then in the end, when I ended that study, after 12 years, there was 80 dogs and I had a record of. Then I realized only one dog, one of those had gotten cancer. Some of these big breed dogs, which I focused on in the beginning, they taking in the large breed dogs. So I'm sorry, cancer. real quick. Yeah. I just want to, one out of 80 dogs got yes. cancer? Yeah, this is the only one that reported having cancer, yes. So that, that sort of blew my mind, and I didn't even want to talk well, about that. Let me just throw out a little statistic for our listeners real quick. So right now, the statistic on dogs dying from cancer in, Cal in, in the United States is one in five. Well, one I in think it's like 70, 80 percent Yeah, dogs. So, but, but one in five right now is what we see. So it's interesting you had 80 dogs in this study that they were all raw fed, and you had one in 80. That's a huge difference yeah yeah no i couldn't even talk about it because people oh yeah yeah right but they and i agree the study was way too small and was very sure. loose it wasn't i didn't document much but that gave me the idea of starting a real study and i, I first of all was to add thousand dogs to this study in the, and i started posting them facebook was around and all that so i could easily reach people and there were more groups with the raw fed um, that, that was talking about raw feeding and all that. So it was easy to recruit. So I started recruiting. And when I got 1,000, I got, oh, well, maybe, maybe I should go for 3,000. So I went for 3,000. Then after that, for a couple of years, then, OK, I want to go for 5,000 now. So I went for 5,000. So now I'm going to go for <laughs> 10,000. Well, how, how many dogs are you trying to? Well, let 6, me back up a right little now. bit. 6,000 dogs. 6,000 are in the study yeah. that you're doing right now. You're 6,000 dogs. Yes. I'm just going to yes. back up a tiny bit. So going back to Norway, is are the health problems that we face in the United States um, and maybe other countries, but I can only speak mostly to the United States, are they the same or are they less than or non-existent? I don't know the, num the true numbers. Honestly, uh, back then, I never even thought about even checking into it. Now it's probably, uh, I can get some numbers, but they're still probably not very far because kibble is huge in Norway too. They don't you know, Most be, people be, there feel kibble like here. Probably 95 to 97 percent of people still feel kibble, feel kibble. We are just a tiny, tiny fraction of pet owners. I mean, here in the United States alone, there's 70 million homes with pets. And I bet 95, 97 percent of them still feel kibble. So this is very foreign. That I meet people daily, almost uh, not daily, but most people doesn't know what the raw food diet is. The regular pet owner, they may be heard about it, but they don't they don't have much of a concept. It takes a, some sort of a tragedy, or some awful event happened yeah. to their pets two or three times in the two three generations because before people wake up and start wait a minute this is not right this is happening over and over again yeah. then half the kind of people i get as clients they want to just finally figure out i have to do something or they come to me with dogs with cancer because I, I deal with dogs with cancer and i probably have four a little over 400 documented cases that's where i learn most from Cancer yeah. Cases. yeah, most but of the time, all 99% of those dogs are kibble fed. I really, really get a raw fed dog with cancer. You really, if I do some, something dramatic that happened to them, maybe some it rescued a dog or something, or they, they don't know the vaccination history, or, or right. they had something happened to them. I had the one dog that got into to rat poison and got cancer six months later, they raw fed all his life. So that 
dramatic like, things like that can crash the immune system and then the uh, raw fed dog will get cancer too or could get cancer. Too. What would you could say a healthy animal's <laughs> lifespan should be? Right? Uh, if no, I, this, it is still is, the, the, and this bothers me a little bit, it is still very much uh, size dependent too. Tiny dogs, those small breeds and stuff, could easily live into their 30s, in my opinion, late 20s, early 30s. Mid-sized dogs should definitely live into their 20s. Yeah. I and mean, you see that in yeah. Australia and stuff, that there are dogs, their farm dogs live into their 30s. And giant breeds should live into their 15s, and I'm working on extending that life, but double the lifespan that's expected now for Danes and those other great, uh, giant breeds, which is six to eight years. Right. Some live to the 10, but it's a fraction of them living to 10, but uh, most of those uh, is, you know, down either with heart issues and other things before they're 10 years old. And I, my Dane lives now closing in on mid teens. So I know they can live longer, and I had several in my study that's way past 10 years and running around, and I'm happy. So yeah. I know it can be done. Right. And it can be done in a way that they're not suffering, right? We're not talking about prolonging a life. Oh, no, no, no. We're talking yeah. about equality as yes. well as... Good, as well healthy, as. healthy life and no disease. Yeah, what, what happens with these bigger ones, they get, get a little maybe stiffer in the joints, get a little arthritis and things like that, but there are ways to manage that too. And uh, no, there's not just keeping them alive, no. They, okay. they, you want a functional dog that are happy, yeah. Sure, sure. And uh, sure. yes, everybody slows down. I mean, we slow down, you know, you get older sure. and things, so that happens to dog, but we can expand that much, much longer so they can live old, healthy. Yeah, I asked, I asked, the reason I asked that question is because so many times I hear, well, my dog ate whatever kibble they're eating and lived to be 17 years old. And then I will ask the client what that looked like. And if I get the truth, which I don't think I always do, they will say, oh, well, yeah, I mean, he had ear infections his whole life and he had arthritis <laughs> and he had skin problems and he had pancreatitis every other month, you know. So I wanted to clarify that um, longevity is great, but only if it's coupled with health. We're not trying to just extend yeah, lives. Yeah. And so that, that's really what it is. Going back to, um, to Norway again, and because I'm trying to do this little comparing, so uh, a lot of our listeners are in the U.S. We do have listeners all over the, the world, but most of them are in the U.S. Um, in Norway, because before someone says, "Well, in Norway, they don't. They just have big dogs that run on the farm." Is that is that something that's happening? Do they have little dogs living in their homes? If we're going to compare these two, or do we do in Norway? I've never oh, yeah. been there. Yeah. But there is no doubt that farm dogs and active dogs live longer, even on kibble. Yeah. Absolutely, I see trends like that, and uh, because when I recommend anything, the, the number one is food, and number two is exercise. Yeah. Those two are very close, actually. Yeah. And uh, yeah. The, I see dogs that eat very, very healthy, never get exercise. They get into issues too, because and the main reason for that is the lymphatic system. The lymphatic system is the garbage collector. This is the one that brings right. out all the body, all the toxins and chemicals that you want to get rid of. So, you, and they only work when the dog is moving because they don't, have, it doesn't have a pump like the heart pumping your blood around. The lymph, lymphatic system has no pump. The pump is the movement of the muscles. Mm. So it doesn't have to run around like crazy or anything, but uh, just walk, walk a dog and then activate the lymphatic system. And I tell the owners, uh, it activates your system too. So we need it too. Are the dogs There's in a big, your big difference. The dogs that come into your study, is it all age groups, or are you taking them as puppies? Yes. No, I'm very interested in, in all aspects of raw feeding, from puppy being straight on, on raw food to older dogs that have suffered from all kinds of things, switch their raw food and see how that improved them, because they boost the immune system. And when you boost the immune system, the body starts healing itself. And I have many dogs that are 12, 13, 14 years old in super bad shape, changed over to raw, start running again, start acting like a puppy. When most people said, oh my God, it seems like we're three or four or five years younger. Within months, the, what I love about what, what, what I'm doing is it works almost every single time. When you switch the diet from cable to raw, yeah. you see improvement. And I don't think I've never, ever, never seen improvement. So I know what I'm doing and promoting is 
is the truth is 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 working and it's as satisfaction as the over and over and over and over again. I don't think I can ever think about a dog and that I didn't improve on a raw food diet, regardless of age. Well, that's, yeah, that's I, I tell people, I even tell people, if you would, if you know your dog's going to die next month or the next week or whatever, and it's horrible to say that, but then even that dog would benefit from a raw food diet. Well, with the, okay, so we have a, I'm sorry, we have a dachshund. We mm -hmm. have Melody. Melody, dachshund, that's who I was thinking of right now is Melody. And Melody was a is rescue. It mini? It's mini a mini dachshund? dachshund, little dapple, double dapple, actually. Mm -hmm. She's adorable. And um, she was always on a, well, she was a rescue. So who knows what she was on? She was found walking the streets of Santa Ana and she was rescued. <laughs> and I think she was a breeding dog because of her colors and her pattern and whatnot. Anywho, when Carrie met yep. us, um, she was on whatever she was eating. We even had her on the special diet from the doctors, the, from the vet. Yep. We have now changed her over to the Pronto. Mm -hmm. And let me tell you, that dog that had in like intestinal problems and had really bad pancreatitis, she is doing phenomenal. She's actually really rebounded as yeah. a dog. She's pretty old too. <laughs> she's she's really, oh, we don't know how old she is because she's a rescue, but she really has changed yeah. on this diet. Yeah. So I can definitely attest to that. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. I have a, a, a so many like right so many of these cases and that's why I brought you because you know <laughs> I want people to understand that some people think they can't switch their old dogs. They can't do it and they can't do this and no. you have to start them out as puppies and there's all this information that's out there and how you how you go about doing that but even cancer dogs people think they can't change them if they have cancer. Absolutely if they have cancer. We just had a woman in the studio and her dog had um been diagnosed with cancer and was given the vet was like you got like three months with this dog and he actually went two years and thrived during those two years like that's her big thing like he turned into a puppy again for the last two years of his life and he was an old dog diagnosed with cancer and we switched him to raw so it, oh, I've seen this hundreds of times. Honestly, in 20 years, I've seen this probably more than a hundred, two or three hundred times. Yeah. They always, always improve. But the, the big thing for many, because when it comes to me with a dog and cancer and on kibble, when I start talking about raw feeding, they have no idea what, even what I'm talking about in the beginning in most cases. And and I explain what it does because the key to beat cancer is to improve the immune system. The immune system wants going to, you know, eventually keep the cancer from spreading and those things. But in the meantime, we can give supplements, very powerful natural supplements to start reducing or killing cancer cells. But then they go to the vet to say, oh yeah, I talked to this uh, guy, I don't know exactly, oh, he's from Norway or something. And then he talk about raw feeding and then the vet say, oh no, no, that would be the worst right. thing you can yeah, do. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Since it's so low and it's kind of all the bacteria in the raw food can kill yeah, I was going to ask you about um, that. Why do you think that, so many yeah, exactly, vets are against uh, it? It's the opposite. These are the dogs that need raw food more than any other dog is the ones that compromise the immune system because they cannot rebound without getting the food they're designed to eat. They're carnivores, their digestive system, everything is set up to take nutrients from raw meat. And that's how you bounce back. I see a big, big difference. I, I was going to say, and this is the truth, I've never, ever seen a kibble fed dogs survive cancer long never. term. Never. never. Me either. Never. It and it goes very happen. quickly. It It'll go very, very quickly. I know this is brutal to hear if you have a kibble fed dogs with cancer and you don't like raw or vegan or have all kinds of things against raw feeding. It's a terrible thing for me to say, but it's the truth. This is everything I say is from my study. I don't read, read anything else. I just see what I see in one or two or three times. Then I start talking about it. That's science to me. And then I kind of repeat it even more times, then it becomes really stronger science to me. Right. But so right. I have this very unique situation where I have all these dogs in my study I can draw from and learn from, and plus all the dogs that done uh, dealt with with cancer. Nobody has a record of me and like me and documented so carefully. I don't charge anyone for any anything when it comes to cancer in dogs. All I ask for, I want your story. Share it with me so I can learn, and then I won't charge you a dime as long as we work together. Yeah, that's amazing because it's your study. No, you, 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 I, you can, there's no books about this. There's no, there, there's no yeah, education. You can't true. go to school for these things. Your this cat is, is behind you. This is all based on experience. Yeah. Oh, Who, sorry. I'll be. Who's behind you? Uh, 
Oh, well, that's one of my cats. <laughs> so, um, in I've your... I've a few cats and two Great Danes. When you... But I had dachshunds. I wanted to give back to you and your dachshunds. I had two mini dachshunds yeah. that I, I got when they were 13 and 14 years old. Kibble fed all the life, lived in New York, uh, in Manhattan, New York, worked every day on the streets of New York, never saw grass, never saw anything. And they had dog walkers that came in there and worked them once a day. So they bought a place here in Utah, um, a, a home, like a vacation home. So they brought the dachshunds over. And I was teaching skiing at the time, and other ski instructors say, hey, you, they're looking for a place to keep these dogs. And when they went back, they wouldn't take them back to New York. So they said, hey, this guy over there, he's, uh, he deals with animals and stuff, asking me if you want to take them. And I took them. And I had them for eight years. Here they lived with me. <laughs> and they, they um, no, seven, seven years, because one got 17, now they're like, uh, 15 years old. And they were kibble fed. They were fat. The stomachs would, you know, sort of kind of hitting the ground and, and things like that. And I switched to raw food diet. They said, do whatever you want with them, Tommy. We trust you. You know what you're doing, all that stuff. So, and they bounced back. They, we, we, the first time we walked with them, they can only walk like maybe for five minutes. And then I have to take them back to my car and I walked the full uh, walk with my Danes. Within six months, they did the whole turn with my Danes running around all happy. Yeah. And they lived there were 17 and 14, and uh, they were fully vaccinated every single year, all this stuff, then, and their raw food bounced back. They, they become, like, when the owners came to visit, they come to visit very often. I said, my gosh, Tom, I can't believe what you've done with these dogs. It's like they were five, six years ago. So, yes, it works. But you your know, dog probably can, I, I don't know how old it is, but it's definitely going to add some years to it. 12, 13? Yeah, she's at least 12, 13 years old, at least. And uh, yeah. she was doing really These little bad. These are, are, are just, tough yeah. little dogs. I mean, I, yeah, I wish I, I, they're both gone now, but uh, gosh, I miss them so much. And it was so funny when next to my giant, my Dane, they, <laughs> they don't even reach them to the knee, you know. <laughs> just, well, they're so little. You know, little so, you know yeah. talking they, about weight which um in the u.s is a huge problem so many dogs i see are obese and it leads to so many problems um in certain breeds it's even worse in like the dachshund because they're back and they're um, back right certain dogs yeah. with their knees um what do you tell people who say that's okay tom i'm feeding the weight management kibble yeah so right yeah. so first of all kibble the difference in kibble is just the names everything pretty much the same it may be a started out different, but in the end, after cooking it a few times and adding or doing all that processing, it's pretty much nutrition-wise and anything else, I end up as exactly the same, the low end and the high end, because they're cooking it to death. You right. know, cooking up the enzymes, ruining some of the vitamins, the, the amino acids getting linked up, the body can sort them out. So the, the, is that, is that, and the, all, the, all the vitamins that are added in later is all synthetic and the, and the carnivore is not good at handling synthetic vitamins it's totally different from what we define in food so that that is an argument based on something they don't know so if i start explaining these things in what's in kibble and how they manufacture no some will say oh my gosh i didn't know some others say oh, well my dog looks fine you know i don't see any problems so they will continue doing it until something happens little do they know that things are brewing inside I think cancer can start five, six, seven years. Before probably. We see I know. It. You, you wouldn't have detected, they wouldn't Absolutely. know. Absolutely. Yeah. And then when the immune system has become enough compromise, it will eventually not be able to stop the cancer. It will not lead all these apoptosis and those regular mechanisms the body has to deal with cancer. We all have cancer cells. Right. It's natural. <laughs> but the immune system knows how to handle it. So when the immune system get enough compromise with the kibble, the, all the uh, heat of vaccination, the flea tick, the heartburn, all those things, just lower, 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 lower the immune system, and one day, not one day, but eventually cancer is going to start growing. Well, that's what's so... And other diseases. That's what's such the struggle for us as nutritionists is because usually by the time they reach us, that dog has already been riddled with cancer yeah. for five or six years, yeah. and he's 14 years yes. old, and they think they can just you know, switch them off this diet and instantly it's, and it, 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 we've had, their, their lifespan is already so short. We don't have right. time to fix yes. what it is, which is why I love when people like Nikki take a puppy and say, I'm going to start from day one. 
because yes. that gives us the best, the best chance at longevity, right? Is if we start from day one and not wait until the illness sets in. That's so important. Yeah, because you, you keep the, the immune system strong and that's the key to any fight any or prevent any disease is the immune system. And 70% of the immune system sits in the, in the gut. And we need to keep providing bad stuff into the gut, like kibble and those things. The, the, you know, the immune system go, will go down. Right. There's no way they can sustain it. So starting a puppy on a raw food diet is, is absolutely the best prevention for anything. Right. Now we, we went through that with Winston. Yeah. Is uh, We had talked about she, Nikki has a, a little Maltese that oh. it was interesting that you talk about the gut because I try to explain to people all the time, like you can, when puppies are born from their moms, right, they get a lot of their gut bacterias and stuff. So yeah. we struggled in the beginning with him because he started to have ear infections and she had started him off on a raw right away, but we had to restore <laughs> his gut. We had to get that gut going from what his mother didn't give but him. But we still have the allergies. We're dealing, we're still dealing with the allergies yeah. and now we still have that problem with that, that, um, prescription that you told me not to use, but he's so miserable that we've given in. And I know yeah. we haven't told you this yet. <laughs> I'm Carrie, just I'm hearing so this sorry. for the first time. Well, if you, Nikki, contact me later, I, I'll, I'll, I'll we can show you how to get rid of those allergies. Oh, I mean, I can talk about you. it in walls and <laughs> supplements that people are very concerned about. So I, I, I don't know if that's the right thing. What I hate no, to you're do, fine. Not hate, but I don't want to work, what I don't like to do is to mention supplements in these settings the people grab that okay oh yeah i'm gonna give it that to my yeah. dog now so they just start doing it without no planning and no you know consulting and nothing and right. so i can mean i can give you three supplements now that we pretty much going to take care of it Excellent. i can mention yeah. it but i don't want anyone to start doing it themselves yeah i'll have nikki call you i agree with you yeah. because that happens a lot to me i will suggest something to a client and then yeah. Five other people are like, well, I'm just going to use what Nikki used. Well, wait a second. I need to know your dog and your, you know, the situation. And we have to discuss it and you have to understand it. So I agree with you. It's really hard to just take every single thing and just say it works for every situation. Right. So yeah. that, I absolutely agree with being careful. Like even the raw diet, which is where I want to kind of bring you back to a little bit so that we can talk about what you mean when you say a raw diet because there's so much confusion i've oh, had good. i had exactly a woman what I, was thinking. Good, I always good. go back to this story because i'll never forget it but i had a woman i asked her what she was feeding her dog and she says i feed him the raw diet which always makes me ask the next question is what is that so i said what is that what do you what is everything that you're feeding and she told me she cooks up chicken and rice and that was what she thought was the raw diet. So can you define mm -hmm. for us what you mean by raw diet when you talk about it? Yeah, well, let me ask Nikki first, what do you feed now? Tell me what you feed that dog. So maybe I can it's enlighten the, something in the food if I see something. So she's feeding right now. Um, we, put, we had her do, um, trying to figure out, he did pretty well on buffalo um, that he's eating. Yeah, so it's the one, the identity, That's it? I think. Well, it's a can that she's doing for him. It's a, it's, it's a canned food by, I don't know if I should say the name of it, oh. if we're going to do this um, right now. <laughs> yeah, no, but what I, I see, I'd say one it's, problem already. It's the raw food that yeah. Carrie um, suggested for him because we... we Is we he had, only on the identity? That's the, now I just said it, but it, he's only did. on the canned food? He's only on the canned food. Oh, I didn't know. I thought we had got him on to something no no because if anytime we give him the the, the little pellet one uh -huh. can i say the name yeah <laughs> might as well anytime we give him pronto if we give him beef pronto he starts itching licking his paws after he's eating um we're trying to figure out and you should have seen carrie and i trying to get the saliva sample from this little five pound dog yeah to get his yeah. allergies tested but um we sent in a did we send it in yeah we sent yeah. it in we sent in a test uh, -huh. uh dr dodds's test yeah, okay. So So um, how long have you been on the raw food now? Well, he's been on a raw food since he was born, or since we got him at six months old. He's been on a raw um, food oh. diet, but we were trying to figure out which one he's not allergic to because he just goes bananas. So what's the last vaccination? We only do the vaccines that uh, Carrie tells me to do. <laughs> the only thing she did was distemper parvo individually. In the, when he was young. Yeah. When yeah. he was young. That was it. That's all. And no flea, tick, no. and heartworm when doing no. any of those. No, 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 no. Okay, so so then we can kind of rule out some vaccinosis and things like that, yeah. But what I suggest when, when I roll for diet, I think the minimum would be feeding four to five different proteins. 
and two to three different livers. So these are things I can share because people need to know those. Yeah. And uh, one eat liver and then find another two that you can add into the food. Then adding an egg in every other day, every three days, that in itself can get really, really close to an excellent, excellent raw food diet. But since the way we treat the soil and things like that now with fertilizer and uh, pesticides and all that junk, that kills a lot of minerals. Uh, so I do always uh, suggest to add a mineral supplement, preferably ionized so it can reach a much more bioavailability and it can reach the cells and those things. And, and MSM, which is sulfur, is another very good thing to add for, for, for the immune system, the wisdom immune system. Another thing is, um, Gold is silver when you're dealing with allergies. Gold is silver is one of the, this is when I probably get in trouble with some people that are listening. They don't believe it. But I think it's my favorite, absolute favorite thing to use for um, bacteria, if there is any time with bacteria infection going on and other things. But um, that those three things, I mean, the, the, uh, correcting the food and get more protein in different kinds. That also creates a balance. We all talk about balance. Is there something you want to mention? Because everybody that go to a raw food diet freak about um, how am I going to balance this thing? Because there's no label on the meat I buy. You know, they come from kibble, but everything has a label on the bag. Or well, they have a label on it. <clears throat> Explain all the nutrients in that kibble bag, and then 100%, 100%, 100%. Okay, oh, this is great. Feels like I'm doing something really good. I'm feeding my dog 100%, you know, balanced diet, which nobody really knows even what the numbers are coming from when you really think about it if you go back in time how how do you know we need exactly that much vitamin d or vitamin b or c right. or, or right. So listen nobody really knows this is a guessing game then again everybody's different you should need different different neutral requirement i have different but nobody knows what that is really the only one that knows is the body so if you can provide the resources for the body to balance itself from within because every cell in the body sits and asks, if we need something, they will signal to the body, hey, I need this, I need this, I'm going to build this and this protein, I need these resources. If they're available, the body will provide it. If it's too much of something to feed, then the body will probably go on and store it as an organ reserves. Because we are men, sometimes happens that we can't find food. You know, these are things we have from way back in time. Dogs have the same thing, they don't eat every day. So they need organ reserves so they can survive. They can also switch the metabolism, we can too, to, to fat burning, which is a ketosis, keto, ketogenic diet. They have all kinds of abilities to, to survive. If they don't need something they feed, then they just purge it. Well, you don't need that, why, why, why keep it? So the balance is an illusion where people think they can balance the food from outside. It's impossible because then, you can buy a piece of chicken from Florida and maybe one from Utah. Could be totally different. You don't know the nutritional content of this thing and micronutrients. They made it up. You can go online and see what um, four it's ounces true. of chicken contain really these type of nutrients. But uh, that's absolutely no guarantee for that. So that's going to drive yourself crazy if you try to balance air. Uh, and I might go in trouble with you now. From a nutritionist that set up this is what you need to feed your dog and this is all the micronutrients and all these things honestly nobody really knows is that really happening but the body knows what it needs that's the way we kind of had to switch around let the body pick our balance itself we just need to provide the resources to do it right that's true balance that's how we balance no you and i, me and I the agree dogs. with you i don't i don't follow the um i told you i have I've gotten in trouble with nutritionists as well because they, well, you need to have, all your clients need to have a scale and they need to measure this and weigh this and ounces of this and all of this stuff. And I don't do that because I don't, I don't do it for myself. And I just kind of, I really like to do rotation and I like to add a lot of different variety and things. Yes, that's um, the key. Varieties. I don't overfeed my Excellent. dogs. I don't, you know, my dogs eat once. I, we, we had talked about, I've talked about this on the show before. My dogs fast twice a month. Um, they eat once Sorry. a day. They don't eat twice a day. I don't bombard their system with, with food that it, it's trying to process all the time. So there's a lot we can talk about and get there. I'm going to have Nikki call you for sure. So you guys can you. get a little bit more comfortable in, you know, talking about what we can do. I'm always 
open to educating myself as well and listening to people who I think know what they're talking about. So I think he's going to be a good resource. Thank you. Um, <laughs> when we talk about the study, I just wanted to ask you, when you bring dogs into this study, what what do they need to be accepted into your study? Do they Are they vaccine-free? Those kind of things. What is it that gets them into your study? No, no, they're nothing. They, they, I don't have any requirements like that up front. And I'm not later either. Yeah. <laughs> In, up front, it, all I want them to feed a raw food diet. I, I, I don't have the resources and time to bring kibble to a dog in and start comparing those things. I don't really need it. That, that data is out there. All the data on dogs today when it comes to disease and longevity and those things are based on kibble fed dogs, basically. That's where you know, the raw feed, the few raw fed dogs happen to be part of that statistics. It's not gonna, it's not gonna affect it. So any statistics on longevity, heart disease, kidney disease, liver disease, all these uh, joint issues, arthritis, all these are based on kibble fed dogs. So that's sort of my, what I compare my numbers with. Right. So I do any kind of raw food I'm interested in, pre-made from different companies, all that they, they can enter in as long as they feed a raw food diet. All I ask up front, because I learned my lesson about this, you know, 20, 15 years ago, if I ask too many questions up front, like the vaccination and, and what they do, then people, oh, wait a minute, what is he gonna do with all this? So I don't do that. I just ask for the age of the dog, the, the size of the dog, the breed, of course, the owner's contact information, and then when they started a raw food diet, and uh, that's pretty much what I ask up front. A year after, then I send out another email where they ask them to update their information, and in that point, then I know they're part of the study, at least if there is not. I, I do lose people register, and I do these people all the time. But these are the ones that will stick with it. So that form asks much, much more in detail, all about the vaccination history. They ask about how often they walk the dog, exactly what they feed, what kind of environment they live in, they live in a house, they live in an apartment, they live in a city, they live in the country, you know, all these things that I think is very important for me to get a good picture of why some dogs won't live longer, why other ways, you know, same breed, same size, and look at that differences out there. And then I try to analyze it if I can see some, some trends, I'm always looking for trends at this point before I publish anything. So a more question like that about um, the vitamins, how often they see the vet, you know, all kinds of things that I think is important for me to get a really good idea what's going on with each dog. So first, it's not a lot, it's just a registered dog. Later, I start digging in. Okay. And I do that once, I ask an update once a month. But I promise you this, I don't know, promise, but these updates the most boring things in the world. It's the same thing. Oh, excellent, nice dog running around. Oh, still fine. It, it, until they get really old, then it's things start slowing down, of course, but from dogs that are one year till 10, it's, just, it, it's the same thing over and over again. Every year, they get the same. Oh, everything, nothing changed, everything's good, you know? Yeah. So unless somebody cut themselves, did something, you know, had a little injury, some dogs get injured. So that will be the only difference, but health-wise, it's just so consistent all the time. I never get that awful thing, oh my God, my god they got cancer last month or something yeah, like that yeah. I, 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 I barely barely get any of those what's the so, oldest what's the oldest dog in your study he said in 19 there's um, a couple of them one is 18 and 19 and they're mixed breeds so what exactly breed though that's smaller dogs definitely tiny like still more than miniature dogs mm -hmm. and they're, they're mixed breeds these mixed breed dogs are tough <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but it's true. I have many others. I, I need to go in and check them, but they're many over 10, 15 years old. So I'm said that should have problems now. That's super healthy. And how far into the study are you right now? I'm 20 years into it, and it probably could take another 10 years before I publish anything. Wow. But the way I'm going to do it, these are lifetime studies. So each dog has to live out their life. Right. And it just kind of sounds horrible. I'm waiting for more dogs to die so I can, you know, get yeah. more dogs in there sounds horrible but i don't have enough dogs for me to to publish something that will make a difference right so what i do right. now i realize that was my goal from the beginning i'm not going to even talk about it nothing nothing but i see so many interesting trends uh, I, as a it's almost like a disservice to people and dog owners and all this that i don't share what i found out and see as trends so that's why I'm now 
since I, two years ago, a year ago, started to do what I'm doing with you guys. I go out and I talk about what I see because I think I can, and I know I have saved many, many dogs doing that and brought many to, to raw feeding because uh, somehow they trust what I'm saying in most cases. I mean, not everybody, but I have very good data to, to back up. With no, I, I'm not going to... I don't want to go public with things because I'm doing things that is a little sensitive for some people, and I do using supplements that you know maybe is not the most. Um, I don't have to explain it, but they can create some controversy, and I don't want to expose those things to my study, and then I have 20 years just go away. Or, right. Like, uh, right. You know what I mean? I'm using natural things that, and anything natural that cures are very difficult to talk about online in in public. Sure. I talk about it with my clients, but um, I can't. Uh, but in in general, the, what I see is definitely a work in, enormous improvement in health and longevity, like a healthy long life for someone uh, looking for. I'm, I'm more, uh, mostly into prevention. I want to prevent disease. I want to extend their lives. But doing all this, I get and most of the word of mouth. I, I get other cases where, I, where there is disease, where there is cancer, where there are yeah. joint yeah. issues. There are all kinds of things that dogs suffer from, especially on kibble and those things. But I also learned that even if they were on kibble for two or three years and we switched to raw, they make an enormous improvement. But I see a trend which I don't like. In the end of their life, they seem like all these the things that could have happened in the past and the young common come back in the, uh, later in life, like especially joint issues that I don't see on the dogs that have started with the uh, raw from, from day one. But in some other cases, would have been on cable for three, four years, switch to raw, have great 10 years, maybe 12, 13 years, and then it really comes back and hit them, mm -hmm. uh, especially in the joints. And I, I think that's related to things that happened in the past. In the I mean, past. I have no yeah. evidence of it, but you know, that's part of trends I, I, I see quite often. Right, right. Document, um, I'm documenting that, of course. Let's let's go back a little bit, and because I'm going to have you define what you mean by raw. What do, when you say a raw diet, what does that consist of? Well, this is another thing I'm getting in trouble with with many very known and well-known raw feeders and promoter of raw feeders with enormous Facebook groups and things. I'm not an advocate of feeding vegetables and 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 uh, and uh, fruits, and I never done it. I mean, my Danes ever in 20 years never given them one piece of vegetable and no piece, well, no one piece of fruit. So I'm all feeding, I'm only feeding raw meats, mm -hmm. a variety of raw meats. I don't see it. I have a little bit of an education in chemistry, another thing from Norway, biology, when I studied animals and things, but I, and I'm much more digged into it here. I don't see any evidence that a dog can utilize uh, vegetables and fruits in a way that they can draw nutrients from it. And the main, main issue I have, they cannot ferment it. There is no place in a carnivore's digestive system where there is a place to ferment vegetable or fruits, which is required to get the nutrients from it, at least nutrients enough for them to really benefit from it. I don't think it really hurts a lot. It hurts if you give a lot because it kind of get the pancreas to produce more enzyme than it can, and it might put some stress, and we've seen some enlargements of the pancreas for for dogs that are fed quite a bit of vegetables. And when they take the vegetables out, the pancreas goes down. So there is something going on there, but again, nobody's willing to do real studies on it. This is just observation I have where they had had problems with the pancreas and then removed the vegetables and then things have gotten better. Hmm. But I don't want to say people not to feel vegetables because a lot of people are just need to feed it for their own peace of mind. They just think it's working and that's fine. Yeah. What I suggest, yeah. if you really need to feed it, and I would do that too if I if think it would help, is is uh, deep green vegetables. That's fiber. I just don't like the vegetables and 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 uh, fruits that have sugar in it. Yeah. Because I deal with yeah. a dogs with cancer, and I, I firmly can see, and I've seen it over and over again, taking the sugar out of a diet, especially in the beginning, will help or even put dogs in a short-term ketosis. So the burn fat instead of sugar, that would help start the cancer cells. I see good results with that. So that's you know kind of what I'm a little bit too much against. Maybe 
these, these sugar and carbs in, in uh, yeah. vegetables and fruits. So it's, it's interesting. There's definitely some controversy and debates even within yes. the raw community. Um, we Absolutely. see that a lot where I feed my own dogs vegetables. Uh, I do yep. stay away from some of the sugary vegetables like carrots, carrots. Um, and yes. those kind of things I'll stay away from. I like to, you know, I spent some time, people have heard this before, um, but I spent some time with some wolf experts down in um, Yellowstone and particularly talking to them about diet and figuring out what they have seen wolves eat and, you know, kind of following along with, with, and so that's why I'm so interested in your study because I do want to see what happens in 30 years and what we're seeing because there is such a big controversy. And none of us, just like we were talking about before, none of us really know how much an animal is supposed to eat or, or what's going on. But when I was speaking with the wolf experts, they had lots of cases of wolves eating berries and eating grasses and, and, oh, yeah. and eat those kind of things. And so it, it makes sense to me as you know, I continue on my journey of learning that we would have to replace the things that we can't provide in nature, which would be usually grasses or um, fur that I've heard they use for fiber, which makes sense. I see it all the time when I see coyote poop and stuff. So, mm. so your study is really amazing to me because it is a little bit different than we are on the same page a lot of times, you and I, um, just from speaking with you. But I do feed my dogs vegetables, um, mm. but not a, not a, I, I feed them raw. They eat a lot of meat. They la eat a lot of blood. They eat a lot of that kind of stuff. But I, I do. Often. That's all fine. Yeah. 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 No, so, I just don't see and, and I'm missing the enzyme cellular waste too that is required to break down, you know, cellular yeah. loads and turn these, these things in that is totally missing in a, in a carnivore. Right. So I just don't see it. I, I don't think it's going to hurt. And I, I, you know, you, people like sugars, sugary things. Is it good for you? Sure. Does it make you healthier? And, yeah. and, and I bet wolves like the taste of uh, blueberries and whatever berries they can find. It tastes good, right. but is it really thriving on it? Are they benefited from it? Sure. That's, so, that's, so that's probably why they, they like the taste of it. Yeah. And definitely if they can't find food, they will eat anything. They get, you know, they get hungry, so they, yeah. they're trying to stop the hunger. And, and so, so it, and I think there is a little bit of amylase released in intestines. And I, I know animals know how to self-medicate. We know that from the animal world, especially gorillas, things like that. They can do amazing things if they're sick. They eat certain things they normally won't eat. Right. They even fold, fold the leaves in a very specific way to scrape out their intestine. Like a, it, it's like a hard like leaf you would think you could live if you eat it, but they eat those things. They, the animals, some might, you see animals eat dirt a lot. That's usually a sign of lack of minerals. They chew on sticks and things like that. That that can also be some mineral deficiency. But I think with that little amylase, they could you, that in the intestine might be there to digest maybe a berry or two or some fruit, sure, some fruits sure. and stuff, or get some type of nutrients from it. They're not going to get the full thing since they can't ferment it. But there might be something like that. And, and some people think that's why they have that amylase amylase in the intestine. Not, there's nothing in the saliva, but there's some little that be secreted down in there. Just in to the help, our, just to help our listeners a little bit, he's talking about an enzyme that, that we produce in our mouth to help break down sugars and starches, but dogs don't have that when yeah. they start to, their digestive system is much shorter than ours, which is why they don't ferment the veggies in their intestines like we can do. Um, but that's what you're talking about when you say amylase, um, it, it's a, it helps to break down carbs. In the in the body, so and dogs don't. I think if have you it. Eat, really want to feed vegetables, get fermented. I can see that could help yeah. them. Yeah. Ferment so, it first. You know, it's just that's why your study. I can't stress it enough. This is why this study is so important, because it it's taking it's also taking away. You know, we have so many veterinarians that are against a raw diet, and they're they always say there's no studies. There's no studies. There's no studies. So. I'm referring to my study because all day I stuck on his science you know I, that's not scientific in my mind it's complete science because they're repeating things over and over, over again but for them that's their the, the main objection what i'm doing is i never said that scientific study i said it's an observational study of raw fed dogs thousands of raw fed dogs and cats i was like cats in my study and that's what it is so 
and when I publish things, people are going to take it for what it is. I yeah. mean, if they think I made it all up, well, fine. I, I, <laughs> and they, they think these are actually real people. That, that That's what people trust. People trust, if, if people know, like on, on um, this is not the best comparison, but when you go to Amazon, I mean, you want to buy something you never bought before, you, you look at what people say about it. Yeah? Right. You read the reviews. Right. And, right. and and this this is sort of like the coming from real people in with real life pets in that situation where most pets now live in. We're taking them out of their normal environment what they've created and designed to live in and we created a whole new environment inside a house or apartment, whatever they live. So they're so distant from their original environment where they're designed to live. So we need to close that gap more and more and mimic nature. And um, that's my goal is to, to how can we mimic that without putting them back into the wild? Sure, <laughs> we want sure. to keep them there. Yeah, right. So these yeah. stories, so I want to create the then an environment where pets now live with humans in in their environment. And that's what my study is all about. Because these are real life pets where and, and documenting pets that live in their houses and in their environment. How can we make that better? How can we still make them live longer even in, than they do in nature? Right. Nature is right. brutal. Because that's it. Dogs are pack animals. Wolves are pack animals. The first sign of weakness, you're out. Yep. I mean, you better not limp in a pack. You're yep. out. You know, you can provide. We, we get rid of you. Yep. And they can survive alone. That's what they, people say. Oh, this, the lifespan of wolves is so short. Yes, it is. Because that's a brutal life. They get injured. They're out. They get older. They're out. I mean, they could probably live long. In wolf sanctuary, they do live longer because they're protected. But the sad things now about wolf sanctuary, and that's something I want to do with my own san uh, rescue center when I open. I want to start uh, adopting these wolves, and, and because they're kibble fed now, and there's a massive amount of cancer in wolf sanctuaries. Mouth cancer is very often getting that because they can't afford to feed raw meat, and they will, the kibble companies are donating or giving them kibble so they start feeding wolves kibble and now we see more cancer you go on the wolf sanctuary's website and you read about the dead wolves oh passed from cancer passed from cancer passed from cancer and my vet that unfortunately died three months ago she and i went up the wolf sanctuary up in another state here and she just the first time she came god tom this oh, oh, half of the wolves have <clears throat> cancer now i said why that's not me they may no they feed kibble oh okay that's one yeah Sad, yeah. No, every time I see dogs with cancer, they're kibble fed. Every time. Every time. Yeah, so. and they get off. There's they, so much cancer in the mouth, too. Yeah. You know, that, and those are hard, really, really difficult to get. But there are ways to get rid of that, too. But these are often things that also get discovered earlier than any other because people, you know, look at the pets, look at the teeth, you know, do teeth cleaning. That, that's when they find it. And often they can find that pretty early so you can do something about it. But get to a point where you have to take the whole jaw out, you know, and that's sort of a life, you know, do you get to a point, is this really worth it having a dog with no mouth, sort of, and you get a, what you're gonna, kind of life is that, so it's a, it's a horrible type of cancer. You might so Tom, you're working on another little project, I shouldn't say little, but another project, aren't you? <laughs> Tell me a little bit about that. No, I have three phases. The first phase was my uh, 80 dog study, then was adding thousands of you know, as many as I can in, into my regular study, and I accept pets for all over the world, which is so interesting to see people from countries in the world. Oh my God, they grow food here? And then and it's just so interesting where they're spread all over the world now. And what is, they're all alone, you know, they don't know what they're doing, and then and I'm trying to help them as much as I can. Now, so the third phase is to show what I'm doing and teach others to do the same. That's my biggest thing now. And the best way I can do that is to open a holistic rescue and rehab center where I rescue dogs, compromised dogs from shelters sitting on death row because they are so sick or they have it in issue, they have, no, don't have the funds to, to heal them. So they get euthanized. And this happens in no-kill shelters too. And, um, and But you don't hear about it because that's sort of like a you know, they're helping them, they're, they're not killing them, they're just, you know, they're so sick that they relieve them from the pain, so they euthanize in that way, so that's not really a kill shelter, killing in, in their mind. Right. Which I sort right. of hate. So I will take those pets, if they're not too, too old, but I will probably take those, you know, myself if I walk in there. 
but and I now adopt them and then put them on all these holistic modalities I have created and see work on dogs with different type of conditions. Mainly, they all come boils down to restoring the immune system, and I do that with food. So there will be raw fed, of course, and then I will add other supplements and other things that see important to boost the immune system. So, but I want to show everybody that. I want to do it live. We have a live stream. This whole compound is going to be live stream. All the dogs are going to have their own website. I'm going to tell them exactly what I do with every single dog down to the capsule I give them, all the food, different type of foods, and how I design the diets and all those things to help the dogs. So there's going to be something people can log on and, and, and watch and see. And um, I want to open centers like that all over the world. It could be maybe one person in Argentina, adopting one dog that would one little mini center and I would teach them how to do that and, and, and some some information and it could be shelters already maybe a shelter in Spain when it which to be a holistic center I would help them do that. So I hope to do educate people through live stories like that. They actually can watch these dogs come in, rescue from the shelter, bring them in and then the first meal, the second meal, the first day, second day, first week, everything's gonna be documented. So they don't think I make Missing now sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> I have an uh, Instagram page um, called Long Living Pets. There's 400 cases there that fixed a variety of health issues. They all boil some to the same. The cause is always immune system, but they call a name for every disease to make it even more complicated. Yeah? Yeah. And these are all recovered from just by switching to a raw food. Many of those have struggled for years, five, six years, been to the vet, got all kinds of different medication, steroid or antibiotics over again, different brands, are one giving the, you know, one side effect and to counter that side effect, suddenly they see them giving the pets five, six, seven different medications and nothing helps. And they woke up, somehow they found me or somebody else. All those dogs in that four and dogs is in my study and every single one of them improved by just switching the diet. Else. Have you started that third phase yet? Are you building a location for it? I, I'm, no, I'm just starting a fundraising campaign where I, 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 try, I try to get funding for five years in different sources. They always wanted something in return. I had companies that were very willing to go in and, and, and raise some money, a big chunk of it, but they, they wanted me to teach their product or something I'm using, and I, I'm not willing to do that. So I know I decided I'm going to get the animal lovers to support these things. So I started in a campaign where I asked for $2 from 2 million animal lovers. And I started that last week. Got a couple of very good friends of mine posting it in the newsletter and things. And I, the feedback I get makes me cry. I mean, the people are so, so interested in supporting me and said, this is the one most wonderful thing I ever heard. Is you're not just going to open a shelter and store dogs there and feed them kibble. You're actually going to take action. You're going to yeah. feed them the right food. You're going to heal them. You're going to show us how you do it. They just, I didn't know. I, th I thought, okay, this is, I'm going to do this. But I had no idea how people would react to that. Yeah. So I'm very optimistic yeah. that I can do it. So I need all the help in the world to get that information. I don't ask me for money. Please just share it. And I made it the $2 thing because anybody in my mind that really understand what I'm doing can easily do two dollars. Almost nobody's doing two dollars. They're doing more. Five, right. ten, fifteen, some do even more than that. But I also give my book. I have a book I wrote about getting started on a raw food diet, taking all the fear out, made it super, super simple so anybody can do it. So I give that for free that I normally sell for, for nineteen dollars. So we can get that for two dollars actually. They also get access to my private network that I will run this whole center under that people can log in and see what I'm doing in detail. I will store everything there and I will create protocols that people can copy and all that. Stuff. So that's my phase two, yeah. three, not three. <laughs> that now takes my entire life. I mean, I can't so wait to see it. Writing. I can't wait to see you do it because I've taken dogs. I have one right now that lives with me that I took from somebody who wanted to put him down because she couldn't afford his medication anymore because he had seizures and he was just, he had a lot of problems. And so I took him and I should have documented him. I started to, but then I got so busy, I never finished. I still have him to this day. I think I've had him three or four years. He hasn't had a single seizure in my care at all ever. 
he, we took him off his medication almost, not immediately. I wanted to wean him off because he was on some pretty heavy medications and I didn't want to get him sick. So we weaned him off and then weaned him onto CBD. And of course we started him right away on raw. And now he's completely seizure free, completely on raw, no CBD, no nothing. He's just an amazing, he's not the nicest dog, <laughs> but <laughs> he's well, got always, some issues. You know, he could be worse. He could be dead. You know? Yeah. Yeah. But he's been with me for quite no, a few but years. I, I talking about seizures. I've seen so, so many dogs so get many. on a raw food diet. That's one of them. You really need to kind of limit the carbs massively, yeah. you know, yeah. just kind of get it out, even put the dogs in, in ketosis for a little bit, maybe a couple of weeks, and then slowly get them back on, and these are uh, seizure-free. Yeah. It's, 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 it did it. It's absolutely, every time I have a client who says their dog has seizures, I, that's, I please, like, you have to do this and try this, but it's hard yeah. because we fight, we battle with the vets who want to, you know, continue to look towards drugs instead of nutrition, so. Yeah, the um, seizure happen you know, within six months after some vaccination, this, 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 this triple, double, quote, you know, whatever they put into, they have these, what your vaccine boosters that contain four or five different things, those are, and, but in my opinion, the worst of all is, is actually the one we have to do is, is the rabies. Yeah. But there are yeah. alternatives to doing tighter tests. Yeah, it's getting there. We have a state right now in the union that um, went ahead and made it so you could accept a tighter test. So that's the beginning. Stages. Oh, really? Yeah. I think it's, it's Connecticut. Yeah, yeah. I keep on saying I'm going to research it, but I'm pretty sure it's Connecticut. Connecticut decided to start accepting the titer test instead of just getting the rabies. So it's, it is happening. Um, Dr. Rob was um, the one who fought for that. And so oh, yeah. now we just need the rest of the states oh, yeah. to follow in their footsteps. And hopefully we'll, we won't have to give the rabies vaccine anymore to our dogs. Um, God willing. So... <laughs> Um, Tom. Well, it doesn't make this. This is the vaccination doesn't make much sense. When it, you know, are you getting reminders every year to go and get your booster vaccines <laughs> from your doctor? I know. You know you're doing that. No, I, I don't. know the absurdity. I mean, we, for some reason, we have been programmed to think that we have to vaccinate dogs every year. I know. I mean, one vaccination is enough for me, and then that's going to last a lifetime. Yeah. Yeah. No, and that's I, been that has that's, been scientifically proven. That's the that's yeah. what is so so much of a struggle is that it has been scientifically proven that the vaccines can stay in their body their whole life, but we're not, we're not listening to the science. We can't keep doing that no. and, and our animals are getting sick. Um, Tom, I am going to make sure in all of our show notes for our clients and or clients, our listeners, we will have all of the information so that they can um, get to you. I hope we have some fabulous listeners. So I hope you are um, interested in the study that he's doing and interested in hopefully donating to what he's doing because it is really tough when, when you don't have... We want to do all of this stuff. Like even for me, one dog that I took, I took on that dog and it was costly to put him on a raw diet, to care for him, house him, groom him, do all of those things. So there is going to be some cost involved and hopefully we can help you with that. And so, um, but how do people get a hold of you? Because we're going to have to wrap this up. How, if someone wants to get a hold of you, Nikki's going to call you later. How do we get a hold of you? Uh, oh gosh, I have so many websites now. Um, <laughs> The animal, well, um, longlivingpets.com is one. It's my research site. Longlivingpets.com. Yeah, longlivingpets.com. That's where they can register a pet if they want to be a part of the study. It does cost anything. I don't charge for anything there. Okay. And uh, okay. the animal naturopath is what I do my consultations and things like that. And I do worldwide consultation. I have a very reasonable fee. All goes to the center to help uh, fund the center going in, into my nonprofit, and um, those are probably the easiest to remember. So long, but nobody knows how to spell naturopath anyway. But what <laughs> you can Google Thomas Sandberg animals, it's Thomas Sandberg dogs or something. I'll, I'll come up all, all over the place. Okay. Okay. So, <laughs> well, I just want to thank both of you guys for being here and communicating this because I just feel like we could talk about this for days, weeks, and months before, before you know, we get it, you know. it across to people that 
we need to change our pets' diets. It's the first and foremost thing we need to do is get them on the right diet, the raw diet. Um, whether that means all meat for you or meat and veggies, anything is better than kibble. <laughs> so um, get there, please, as soon as you can. Um, reach out to Tom if you need to reach out to him. Um, and just just really know that there are a bunch of us out here for you that are willing to talk to you and discuss um, ways that you can do it, both for your budget um, and your peace of mind. So not all pet nutritionists, I'm sure Tom is not all going to tell you you have to spend thousands of dollars a month. We're willing to work with you to do whatever that it is that you can do for your pets. Uh, but again, Tom, thank you so much. Nikki, thank you so much um, for being here. And we will make sure all of Tom's information will be in our show notes so you can contact him anytime you want. All right. Anything else, Tom, you no, want to say? Great. great chatting with you. It was, it was awesome. Yeah. Thanks. All right. Take care, Tom. Thank you, Tom. Bye, Nikki. You Bye, Nikki. Thank you. <laughs> Bye.